Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and I had a subscriber suggest that I continue my series on historical newspapers, but demonstrate what an average newspaper contained in the Adambellum period. So I went digging into old newspapers and found an 1835 edition of the Richmond Inquirer dated December 31st. When you look at these old newspapers, it puts history in perspective and helps you realize that these are just average people living in what they thought was an average time. We look back and can't believe some of the events that took place, but to these people, it was just another boring day. So I hope you enjoy and learn something from this newspaper. The first advertisement in this paper is for available land in Mississippi, specifically on the Mississippi and Yazoo rivers. Although it had been nearly 20 years at this point since Mississippi had become a state, it was still sparsely settled. In 1830, its population was about 136,000. By the time 1840 rolled around, the state saw a 175% increase to a little over 375,000 people. This advertisement exhibits why that took place. Speculators and landowners advertised in newspapers all over that land was available and combined that with cotton boom, we see a large influx of people into the state. Subsequently, with an increase in people purchasing land to grow cotton came the need for slaves to work that property. This leads us to the very next advertisement which lists slaves and horses for sale. Virginia during this period was unloading a lot of its slaves for sale in the Deep South. Many plantation owners sought to get rid of what they termed unruly slaves and sold them to the cotton states. Even though you know it went on, it is hard to fathom that animals were listed right alongside humans for sale. In this particular advertisement, three men and a boy were listed for sale. One was said to be a good carpenter and the other a good sawyer. Some slaves became skilled in some craft that could be useful on a plantation. This kept the slave owner from having to hire someone to do the job. Another advertisement just below the previous one is basically a slave auction house saying that they are looking to buy 200 slaves to be sold at a later date. Just below those advertisements for the sale of slaves is two advertisements for female academies looking for students. The top one offers schooling, room, and board for $50 a session, and the other for $85 a session. Keep in mind that we are moving into the common school movement, especially in cities where parents are eager to have their children educated. Cities could be swarmed by children who got up to no good on the streets, but school not only gave them an education, but kept them from forming gangs and wreaking havoc on communities. As we move down the paper, we see that a gentleman from New York has taken out space in the paper to inform his customers that a fire had destroyed his account books and that he lost most of the records pertaining to who owes him money and how much. He asks his customers to please send him their statements so that he could resume business as usual. On top of the request, he also includes that the store offers fine china and glassware. Another school wants to hire teachers to teach the various branches of the English language they want a faculty of 12 to 15 scholars and will be paying them about $150 to $200. In this advertisement, a small slaveholder had passed away and the commissioner overseeing the estate declared that he is going to be selling 12 to 14 slaves at auction on January 1st. Throughout the paper, you'll find various parcels of land for sale and descriptions of those estates. There is an interesting advertisement that I think sheds light on early 19th century labor. It is an advertisement asking for slave owners to hire out their slaves for work on the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac Railroad for an entire year. They will be paying $75 to $90 to hire slaves and more if they are skilled laborers. This advertisement allows us to understand the complexity of labor in the South, especially during the winter months or down period when growing crops. Slave owners regularly hired out their slaves. Yeoman farmers who didn't own slaves might hire one or two slaves for a week to bring in a harvest. Some of those larger plantation owners would hire out their labor to those yeoman farmers or to work in industry. When the famous landscape architect Frederick Law Olmsted went on his tour of the South, he commented that the more dangerous jobs were done by the Irish immigrants on the dockyards and the less dangerous by the hired slaves. The reason being is that slaves were more valuable than poor whites, and if a business hired someone else's slaves, then if they were not taken care of, legal suits could be brought against that business for damage and property. That is why the advertisement states they will be well fed, well clothed, and well treated, but because if they damage someone's property, then no one else would hire their slaves out to them. Just like we go and watch movies or go to events being had around our area, 
they had entertainment available as well. This newspaper highlighted that a museum in Richmond was putting on a stage show called Conflagration of Moscow, which depicted the burning of Moscow during the Napoleonic Wars. This show combined art, music, and performance to recreate the event. The advertisement even states that front row seating is perfect for children. Below that, we see a short article announcing that people wanted to donate to the creation of a monument to George Washington to announce their attention to the collectors of Virginia. Since the fund for the Washington Monument began in 1833, we can assume that this article is actually referring to the construction of the Washington Monument we see today in Washington, D.C. I think it is incredible to see these early histories of monuments. To further illustrate the connection between the Upper South and the Deep South, we see an announcement for a lawyer located in Vicksburg, Mississippi, who intends to deal in the selling of land. The Upper South and the Deep South became heavily interconnected through their economies, and this is just one example, especially when you factor in the other announcements in this paper for the sale of slaves and available land in Mississippi. One of the main articles for this newspaper was a political one. It deals with abolition petitions in Congress. It is a long article, but it recounts the political maneuverings of various politicians in attempting to accept or deny the petition. At least one politician got into hot water because he misunderstood the action to be voted on and went against his own interests. Another main article concerned a fire in New York City. Earlier in this video, we saw a gentleman from New York City explain that he lost his account books in a fire. Well, the fire was a large one that destroyed a large section of the city. It was known as the Great Fire of New York City. It happened in December 1835. It was 17 degrees below zero, and the East River and the Hudson River were froze over, so the firefighters had to drill to access the water below the ice, but the hoses refroze. They decided to deprive the fire of fuel by demolishing buildings, and the local marines and sailors brought gunpowder to explode buildings in the fire's path. In the end, the fire covered 13 acres in 17 city blocks and destroyed between 530 and 700 buildings. The next article highlights the Texas Revolution, which was in full swing. The paper documented all of the events that had occurred up to that point. Because of the great detail and the amount of space dedicated to the story, one can see that states like Virginia were anxiously awaiting news of what was happening in Texas. Plus, many Virginians, Tennesseans, and citizens from all over the country were involved in the revolution, fighting on the side of Texas. Another small article, but extremely significant to American history, is the one telling about the funds of the Bank of the United States and its branch in Richmond, Virginia. It basically announced the folding of that bank. Andrew Jackson had run on the platform that he would destroy the National Bank of the United States. Himself and many Americans viewed the bank as corrupt, especially after the Panic of 1819 when bad banking practices led to one of the biggest financial crises in American history. When he became president, he started his bank war, and it ended with the destruction of the National Bank. This article informs people about its folding in Richmond and where their debts could be paid in the future. Just to illustrate that the world is not so different 200 years ago, there's an article in this paper where Virginians were dissatisfied with their politicians, claiming that they did not represent their constituents. They single out Senator Lee, who had been appointed as a senator when another senator resigned. The paper claimed that he should not have been put in that position, which doesn't actually seem to be true because he won election in that position once his appointment was over, so their claims that Virginians didn't want him is actually false. However, just like news stations leaned one way or another, newspapers did too. The Richmond Enquirer was a Democratic paper, and since Lee was a Whig and helping to censure President Jackson a Democrat, we can fully understand why they did not like Senator Lee. The last thing I will mention within the newspaper is something that allows historians to tell stories of the enslaved. There is an announcement that some slaves had run away from their slave owners. They listed two men, one nineteen and one twenty-five. When historians see these announcements and advertisements for the return of runaways, we can learn a lot about the life of a slave. Andrew, the twenty-five-year-old, was said to be wearing a white fur hat, and Jim, the nineteen-year-old, was said to be wearing a pair of old jean pantaloons. It also gives a good description, mentioning that Andrew had no scars. Some announcements give even more details. One thing I will draw your attention to is Andrew is said to have a wife in Prince Edward County and to be on the lookout for him there. That probably means that he was separated from his wife in a sale, although it was not out of the question for a man and his wife to live on separate farms and still have some kind of relationship as husband and wife. Historians can glean a lot of information from these announcements and it helps us better understand the lives of slaves. 
I hope this journey through an 1835 newspaper helped you understand what was going on in the United States and Virginia on December 31st, 1835. Thank you all and have a great day.